Welcome to GV247.TV, the Global Vision Channel. A non-profit web TV channel bringing biblical perspective to the world in which you live. Hello and welcome to the weekend show with me, Deborah Menelos. And you can see my beloved's not with me this week, but I've got a beloved sister in Christ and her name is Dr. Diane Eager. Diane is Research Associate with Creation Research, which is a worldwide ministry, but it's based in Australia. And she's come all the way from there to meet up with us again because we actually filmed and interviewed Diane at the Answers in Genesis Mega Conference in 2017. And she is featured on a couple of our other channels. So it's really lovely to see her again. And Diane, we're going to get right into it. You're a medical doctor. However, um, you have a, a very strong interest in creation science, for example. Yes. Um, can you just tell me, why do you think the church is disinterested in creation science? The theological colleges, uh, certainly in Australia, have gone down the route of theistic evolution for various reasons, um, academic credibility, wh whatever. But they are training up the next generation of pastors who then go out to the churches filled with uh, theistic evolution and also being told that um, this is creation is a irrelevant side issue, it's not a gospel issue, all sorts of things like that, which I disagree with, of course. Uh, but they then go out and they don't teach their people and that means that people don't hear about it. Now, we find with uh, at Creation Research that people are very interested in it deep down, but they've almost been warned off or they're simply not taught about it. So it's a case of ignorance rather than not wanting to know, which is rather sad. Do you think then that that is the reason why so many churchgoers accept evolution? Yes, it is, because it's the only thing they hear. And on the secular media, of course, on the, uh, t on the TV, the internet, wh whatever news sources they read, they're bombarded with evolution. And the church is not teaching about it. And the church is not teaching the basic biblical truth of Genesis. So that's all people hear. So, of course, they believe it because that's all they know. Is this important to a Christian, um, what they believe about um, where we've come from? Oh, very much so, because what we believe about what we, where we came from, of course, determines what we believe about where we're going. And, of course, that's the centrality of the gospel. So that if we believe that we were made as individuals who are created in the image of God, that mankind is a fallen creature in need of a saviour, well, then, of course, we have an, uh, an opening to the gospel straight away. Whereas if you believe that somehow you've... Uh, come up from the uh, ooze by way of various creatures finally through apes and mankind is some kind of rising creature, well then that's a hindrance to the gospel. So this is an important issue. Diane, do you think that science has actually been politicised? Well, any human uh, activity can be politicised. And this is where it's important to understand that creation is not an issue of science versus religion. It is an issue of truth versus error. What is the real history of the real world? Mm -hmm. Now, science is a human activity. It's a way of investigating the real world, and it's a good thing to do. But like every human activity, it can be politicised because every person comes with their own worldview and their own prejudices. And Christians are, are in, in exactly the same situation. We all have our own ignorances. But uh, if you are a, an atheist who does science, well, of course, you're not going to think that there's evidence for creation or for degeneration or for God's judgment either. So science has become politicised just like any other human activity has become politicised. And uh, we need to be able to sort out what are the facts in terms of actual scientific discoveries and what are people's stories about them. And that's one thing we like to do at Creation Research. We have a regular newsletter where we just trawl the normal scientific news, just what comes out uh, through the media, through the, you know, the BBC or the semi-professional literature and websites and the professional journals. And we 
show people what has been discovered. We tell people what story that the uh, people, uh, that the scientists are telling about it. And then we explain, well, there is a difference between what was discovered and what is the story they're telling about it. So let's have a look at what was discovered and see how we can understand it in the light of biblical history, because God is the God of the real world. And so what has been discovered, in fact, is good evidence for the biblical history of the world. And that helps Christians to stand firm on the authority of scripture and not be afraid of science because science is a good thing if it is used correctly. Um, coming mm. from Australia, Diane, uh, yeah. what, what's it like in, in that country at the moment? Um, is, is it completely evolutionary? Are there still some schools that teach creation science or is it just gone? Uh, Australia is a very secular country. Uh, a bit like the UK, except that we don't have quite such a long history, although our history does go back to the UK, of course. Mm. So some of our laws go back to the UK. In some states, uh, scripture in school is a normal part of the curriculum because that comes from the original uh, English curriculum. But in general, Australia is a very secular country. The government is very secular. So evolution rules, certainly in all the state schools, Occasionally, creation research is able to speak at lunchtime club meetings and things like that. There are some Christian schools who hold to teaching uh, Genesis as literal history, but even they are being very, very highly pressured not to do that. You're talking mm. about the real history of the real world there, Diane. Mm. Um, there may be some people tuning in who think that that's absolutely nonsensical, that you would mm. have a literal belief in Genesis. Oh, yes, yes, well, there are lots of people who pour scorn on us for that. The Bible takes the reader through the creation, a garden called Eden, the fall of mankind, a great flood, the rise of nations, the people called Israel, hope of a Messiah, a period of grace, a day of judgment, and a new beginning. The first five books of the Bible called the Torah are generally accepted to be recorded by Moses in the language of ancient Hebrew. The book of Genesis records the creation of the heavens and the earth and all living things created after its own kind. The ultimate creation was mankind, made in the image and likeness of God and put to work in the garden called Eden. With the command not to touch the fruit that would open their eyes to the knowledge of good and evil, deceived by the serpent into thinking they could become like God, Mankind disobeyed, resulting in the need to remove them from the garden so that they would not reach out to the tree that would give them eternal life. Yet there was a promise of a future redemption to come. Science cannot directly look at the past. If you want to know about the past, you have to have a record from someone who was there and has left a record. And in the Bible, we do have the record of the person who was there, the Creator God. And he has written it out clearly for us. It's easy to understand. And also, as a Christian, I follow Jesus Christ, and Christ is the creator. Uh, it says in the Gospel of John, right, in the beginning was the word, and he created everything, and all things were created for him. Therefore, he has told the truth, and we can believe it. So it's all set out for us very clearly that he made a good world, but it went wrong because of human sin, and God has judged that world. So the real history of the world is from good to bad to worse. Now, it doesn't end there. Of course, it does end with salvation and glory. But the real history of the world is there is a lot of change, but not uh, evolutionary change. It's a good world that is degenerating. Whereas the evolutionary story is that everything started out as a sort of chaos and it's gradually going up. Now, those two things are opposite ideas, so they can't both be true. So what we can do is look at the real world and see, yes, there is change, but is it downhill change or uphill change? Do we see design or do we see randomness? So we can look at those things scientific, scientifically and say, all right, how do we understand this? Is it a good world gone wrong or is it chaos evolving up to uh, some sort of completion? Mm. And uh, that is a worldview. I will be quite honest about that, but everybody has a worldview. 
no one is neutral. So you have to ask these scientists who say, oh, we've found evidence for evolution, where are they coming from as well? So we can be quite honest about that. We have a worldview, but we can justify it both in terms of the biblical history, it is an internally logical story, and the evidence that we see in the world around us today. And it's really exciting to be able to put the two together. What about, you know, everybody's talking about the transgender issue at the moment. Now, what's happening in Australia about that? Very much the same as in the UK. Uh, it does get uh, a quite a lot of publicity. There are pressure groups who are trying to uh, introduce their uh, their ideology or their idea, their worldview, that somehow gender is fluid, meaning that you are not either a man or a woman or a male or a female, uh, because they're trying to introduce this to even young children in, in school, so boys and girls. Uh, they are trying to introduce the idea that gender is fluid. You can choose to be what you want to be, even if it doesn't match what your biological body uh, tells you you are and what your genetics are. So there's, there's a lot of pressure for that ideology to be taught in schools, even in primary schools. So it's much the same as the UK, I gather, from just reading some of the uh, news reports in the, in the, um, from the BBC and from various other sources. Yeah. Um, I think, mm. you know, if this was, I don't know, 50 yeah. years ago, or whatever, people would think that we were kidding, that when you're born, your birth certificate, there should be nothing in there for the gender, that you would choose your gender and, and be able to change it as you go through life. Now, have you any idea who or what is behind this? Is, is, is it intentional? Is it accidental, this belief system? Oh, yes, th there is a, an idea that uh, you are assigned a, a gender at birth. Mm. Um, but that's not true. Your gender or your sex is recognised and recorded. Now, that's quite different to being assigned. The idea of being assigned means that somehow it's imposed on you. Mm. And that is what the transgender activists, the political activists, are trying to get across that concept that somehow your your gender has been imposed on you. But in fact, it's not true. What, has, what happens at birth, of course, is that your gender is recognised. What about the scientific reason behind this? I mean, is there a scientific reason? Well, there's no scientific reason for why someone who has a healthy, normally formed body should decide that they are a boy when they're really a girl or the other way around. There are a few individuals who are born with um, what are called anomalous uh, genitalia, and that is because there has been a problem with their growth in the womb. Now, that is just like any other birth defect where a part of the body hasn't grown properly. So it's like, say, a, a hole in the heart or a cleft palate. Part of the body has not grown properly. Now, that does not change the genetics of that person because your sex is determined at conception. You are either male or female, depending on what chromosomes you inherit, XY for a male, XX for a female. Now, because your body has not grown properly, that doesn't change your sex. It just means that your body is not fully developed according to your genetic potential. And that is no different to any other birth defect. And it should be looked after from uh, medically from that point of view. How can we help this person live according to their genetic potential? Mm -hmm. And we can test for ge the um, genetics these days very easily. It's, it's interesting living in the genome revolution. Uh, it's very easy to determine whether someone is a male or a female. And then the aim should be help them to be what their genetic potential says they are. Now, that's only a very, very small... Uh, number of people who have that problem. Most of the political activists are either uh, are fully formed males or fully formed females. In other words, it's very clear what their biological sex is, but for some reason or other, they want to change into another and force other people to accept that you can somehow choose to be one or the other rather than accept what you are and live according to your genetic potential. 
It is interesting because, and mm-hmm. I think I've said this before, Diane, um, you know, when I was a little girl, um, maybe one day I'd want to be a fairy princess, but the next day I'd want to be a pirate or a secret agent and I'd be want to be able... I thought, you know, if I was a boy, I'd be able to swing through trees, despite reading, reading Enid Blyton, which had uh, George, Georgiana in it, or Georgina, who was called George. Um, you know, so if somebody mm-hmm. had said to me, if somebody had come to the classroom and said, now, what would you like to be, a boy or a girl? I know there's many times I would have put my hand up to say a boy. That's probably how I felt on that day. And I think many people think Mm. that this is the way that the situation will be handled. But of course, there are more, I mean, doctors do take it seriously, don't they? They they test a child, they have Mm. psychological testing and so on to ensure that this is Mm. what they really want to do to change gender. Now, of course, the problem... um, obviously socially is that um, many people feel this is something that's being forced on them now. So so something that affects less than 1% of the population is, uh, is to be, mm. we've to openly embrace that. Mm. And this, it's, it causes awkwardness in so many situations from prison to which toilets you would use in a shopping mall and yes. all kinds of yeah. things. Now, Obviously, we have compassion, as you say, that there can be genetic abnormalities and anomalies. And we have compassion for people Mm -hmm. who have thus, as you would say, in any other way. So it's difficult for Christians to know how do we deal with these situations. But for you personally, Diane, um, you know, being involved in speaking about this, has it had any kind of effect on you? Um, How you think about these things? Has it impacted your life in any way? At all. Well, when I worked uh, in a university, actually, there was a woman who decided to trans- transfer uh, mm-hmm. I- into being a man. Mm-hmm. Um, that did cause quite a bit of awkwardness. Mm-hmm. Um, I didn't work in the same department as her, but I did feel sorry for the men who did, who, uh, who all of a sudden may have in- encountered this person uh, in, in the men's loo, uh, I never asked them about that, mm-hmm. of course. Mm-hmm. Um, but as a Christian, I believe that we are all made as individuals in the image of God, and God wants us to lead the best life we can according to our genetic potential, which is determined at conception. So before we have any thoughts, but God has thoughts. And therefore, People do have um, difficulty in the psychological and social situations that they live in and then they may find there is pressure to want to be different to what their, um, their biological body says they are. And I think the solution there is to help them to live according to the genetic potential that they have been given. Now that may require a lot of love and care and counselling but I think that is the best thing we should aim for because that's when people will be physically healthy mm-hmm. and also mentally healthy. But the confusion is real. Mm-hmm. I can understand that. We mm-hmm. live in confusing times and people are brought up in difficult situations where they are exposed to all sorts of ideas um, about whether uh, about males and females these days. We, we talk a lot about sex these days. We didn't when I was growing up. So I can understand why people are confused, but surely the solution there is to lead people to the truth, to the truth about their biology and to help them live according to what is built into their bodies because then they will be healthy in their bodies and hopefully as Christians we can help them to be healthy in their minds because uh, Christ has said you will know the truth and the truth will set you free from confusion. Diane, are there atheists who doubt evolution? There are, actually. Now, most, most atheists would not come out and say that because their colleagues would pour scorn on them. But it is interesting. Last year, uh, some Canadian, Canadian people did a survey, an anonymous survey, of people about evolution and particularly about human origins. And they discovered there was a small but significant number of people who identified themselves as atheists, but then said they had doubts about human evolution in particular. And we have found in other surveys there are doubts about human evolution that all people have. 
And I think that is because Deep down, people know that humans are different to animals. And to believe in evolution from chemicals through goo to um, you, <laughs> via the zoo, goo to you via the zoo. Like it. Yeah, yes, that's right. Um, the idea that we are the result of molecules randomly banging around one another, who eventually became apes, who turned into people, it just doesn't quite sit right. Somebody had put forward a very interesting question. Um, are humans evolving in Tibet? Uh, there was a story uh, last year and uh, following on from another story f a few years ago about people in Tibet who had a, a, a gene for a blood chemical which helped them to cope with the low levels of oxygen that there are in Tibet and they found that people who had a particular oxygen-carrying uh, variant uh, did better. They, they seemed to survive respiratory illnesses a little bit better. Uh, and uh, so it was put down, oh, this is humans evolving to cope with um, th this thin oxygen. But in fact, it's just a variation of a gene that already exists. It's not a new gene that's coming come into existence. Mm -hmm. And in that situation, it is an advantage for them. To, to have this variation in an oxygen-carrying gene or, or the product of this, uh, of this gene. But that doesn't mean they're evolving. It is an example of natural selection, and that's something we need to remember. Natural selection is actually a real process. But if you think of what the word select means, it just means to choose uh, uh, between existing options. So mm. natural selection does not explain how anything could evolve or how anything could arise. So this is an example of natural selection. People who have one particular gene variant happen to do better if they live in Tibet. It doesn't make any difference if you live anywhere else. So human beings are not evolving. It's just there is a bit of natural selection going on, but that's not evolution either. And Diane, could you tell us briefly, what is naturalism and is that a religion? Well, naturalism is the belief that everything in the world can be explained purely by basically matter and energy, chemistry and physics. Just the behaviour of atoms, the behaviour of energy. All of the things that we consider to be natural rather than supernatural, which has a spiritual dimension. In other words, there is an outside force that can somehow manipulate matter and energy from without, from outside. So in a way, it is a worldview. So it could be called a religion because it is a belief by faith that there is nothing else out there except matter and energy, atoms, molecules and energy, things that are called natural and nothing else. What about biologos? What is that? And uh, Biologos is uh, a, an organisation of people who, um, who claim to be Christians, and I'm sure many of them are, but who believe in evolution. And, the, and they don't have that on their own. There are quite a number of organisations uh, who believe that. Mm -hmm. And in fact, theistic evolution is becoming quite a strong force here in the UK mm -hmm. and also in Australia. And uh, my own personal... Uh, uh, sorry, my own personal um, opinion. belief, opinion, is that I think it is a misguided attempt to maintain their academic credibility because the academic world is very much atheistic and mm -hmm. secular, uh, but at the same time, their faith matters to them in a personal way. And I think it's a misguided effort. Now, of course, I don't know people's personal hearts and minds, so I won't impose any belief on them. But the whole idea of theistic evolution does not sit well with me. In fact, I think it is quite dishonouring to Christ and quite dishonouring to the scriptures. For a start, you have to actually deny that Genesis says what it says in plain language. But one of the most serious problems is in the origin of human beings, because we are told that when God finished the world, and so that included human beings, everything was very good. There was no death, there was no disease, there was no struggle, there was no fear. Everything was very good. But if you look at uh, evolution, 
uh, starting with Darwin, of course, he talked about the war of nature. He introduced the idea of the preservation of favoured races in the struggle for life. That's the subtitle to his book. Everyone has heard of um, the struggle for existence, survival of the fittest, kill or be killed, all of those things. Death, disease, struggle, that is what has supposedly made us if we got here by evolution, because those are the processes that supposedly sorted out the fit from the unfit. Now, those two ideas are completely diametrically opposed. They can't mm -hmm. be the same. But at the same time, we are told God made everything very good. So no death, disease and struggle. Those things came into the world because of human sin. And then God judged the world. He cursed the ground. So things started to go downhill. So death, disease and struggle are part of the world that we see now. But those are degenerative processes. And that is what Christ came to die, to save us from. To save us from our sin in this world and then create a new world where everything is going to be very good. Now you think about it. If God declared the original world to be very good, but it was full of death, disease and decay and, and struggle... In the next world, could we trust him to keep those things out? Because it does say in the book of Revelation, there is no more curse. And we know when the curse came. That was after human sin. And things have gone downhill ever since then. So to me, there are serious anomalies in terms of the authority of scripture. Also, uh, what Christ came to do for us and what we can look forward to in the future. We can look forward to a world where everything will be very good again because there will be no more curse. Won't that be wonderful? We don't need to fear death, disease and struggle. And in fact, death is described as an enemy and it gets thrown into the lake of fire at the end of the book of Revelation. So death is not good. It is an enemy. It will be... Uh, completely disregarded, and we can look forward to a world that's very good. And I think that's where there is a severe anomaly between theistic evolution, God using death, disease and struggle, totally inconsistent with God's character, and God making a good world which has gone wrong, but Christ has come to die for us so that we can now live in a good world once more. Diane Eager, you are a secret evangelist in there. <laughs> thank you very much. It's just been lovely to see you again. Thank you and thank you for watching. This is GV247.TV, bringing biblical perspective to the world in which you live. A powerful free resource with hundreds of short films on a wide range of Bible topics from experts around the world plus full-length sermons and programs for teaching and encouragement. Choose from current affairs, signs of the times, a chance to voice your own opinion, and special offers on our full-length feature films, documentaries and study materials. At over four hours in length, The Lamplight Project is a systematic 12-part Bible study series, a powerful teaching tool that begins with the origins of life and takes the viewer on a comprehensive journey packed with high-profile interviews, film, graphics and illustrations, concluding with the return of Christ and an encouragement to stand firm and be faithful. Complete with a free study guide download for both personal and group study, this powerful interactive guide connects to over a thousand programs with expert interviews on gv247.tv our free service web TV channel. Does My Life Have Meaning? A powerful one-hour presentation produced from the Lamplight Project. With a free copy of the Gospel of Luke, this film is crammed with engaging interviews, film and graphics. A life-challenging film to those searching for answers. As distributors for the Jesus film, we offer this timeless movie based on Luke's Gospel. This clear presentation of the life of Jesus Christ has been viewed worldwide and translated into over 1,200 languages. We provide the film with a free copy of the Gospel of Luke. The Daniel Project is a popular TV documentary that presents an overview of Bible prophecy and an encouragement to read the signs of the times. Hailed as one of the best TV films to be made on the subject, 
DVD extras feature a heart-to-heart -heart interview about the way of rescue. Based loosely on the documentary, The Daniel Connection is a full-length feature film. This fictional thriller incorporates many of the themes promoted through pop culture and social media which affect people on a global scale. Launched at the Cannes Film Festival, The Daniel Connection points the ever-skeptical viewer to search the Bible for answers to life's deepest questions. We've been serving the body of Christ for over 30 years, and if you would like further information, please do not hesitate to get in touch.